The Highway 99 Deep Board Tunnel is a major project with major technical and political complications. Above all, though, this tunnel will bring massive changes to the city of Seattle. In this Seattle Channel special, we'll take a closer look at what a new tunnel and a new waterfront could mean to you. Hello, I'm Brian Callanan, and welcome to this special Seattle Channel presentation, Digging Toward the Future, the story of the Alaskan Way Tunnel. The Deep Board Tunnel is one of the biggest and most transformative road projects in Seattle history, complete with a waterfront makeover that will link downtown with Elliott Bay. We're here at Milepost 31, an interactive museum designed to educate visitors, not only on the construction, but on the history of the area as well. We'll take a look at all aspects of this project, from digging deep beneath the heart of the city to how this construction will affect your pocketbook. And from waterfront business owners to commuters, how does all this work really affect you? To really get into this topic, we've got to head down, deep down underground, and meet up with a very special lady by the name of Big Bertha. Meet Bertha. She's 326 feet long. She weighs 6,700 tons, and she's ready to dig. Bertha, named after Bertha Knight Landis, Seattle's first female mayor, is about to make some history herself. Her 57 and a half foot cutter head, the huge spinning disc used to dig through rocks and dirt, makes her the biggest tunnel boring machine in the world. It's really the project of a lifetime. Chris Dixon is the project manager with Seattle Tunnel Partners, the contractor working with the city and state on the tunnel project. Dixon helped select Bertha's birthplace in Osaka, Japan. The Hitachi Zosen Corporation built her, tested her, then split Bertha into 41 pieces to be shipped to Seattle. Crews now are putting the finishing touches on reassembling her, and Bertha's on track to start digging in late July. We are here to view history in the making. This is an impressive project that has put the great state of Washington into the global spotlight. The spotlight is bright because the exact way Bertha is building this tunnel has never been done before. Here's how the excavation will work. Bertha will move underground at top speed at about six and a half feet per hour. And here's the unique part, where most tunnels are built by placing one panel at a time to form the rings of concrete that make up a tunnel, Bertha will put in two at once. In all, the machine will create more than 1,100 rings of concrete, all bolted to each other over a distance of 1.7 miles. The dug up dirt and rocks Bertha produces will go through a conveyor system into trucks and from there onto barges headed for a disposal facility on the west side of Puget Sound. I think when you look at the investment that they're making long term, it'll be worth it. Don Isaac is one of the majority of Seattleites who voted to endorse the state plan to build the $1.6 billion Alaskan Way Tunnel after years of controversy. But he's still concerned about the actual construction of the tunnel, digging into what he believes could be very unstable earth. Because Seattle is prone to earthquakes, how does that really affect the rumbling and restructure of the soil underneath since this is actually land filled? As we go deeper, the soils get better. The contractor will end up digging down to about 200 feet underneath the city. But when Bertha starts, she's just 20 feet underground. So for the first 1,700 feet, crews have walled off much of the dirt from Bertha by building a concrete box. Bertha will dig through it before her deeper dive at about Yesler. We're very confident that uh, it's going to allow us to tunnel uh, safely under the city of Seattle and to allow us to control the ground as we need to while we're tunneling, so we're looking forward to that. And the state says when it comes to stable ground, in the future, the Alaskan Way Tunnel will be the place to be. A tunnel behaves better than most structures in a seismic event because it moves with the ground, it doesn't react as a result of the ground. Linnea Laird is the Viaduct Replacement Program Administrator for the state DOT. She says taking down the viaduct is a must. In 2007, experts said it had a 1 in 10 chance of collapsing in a strong earthquake within 10 years. The answer, after more than a decade of debate, is a deep board tunnel connecting Soto to South Lake Union. This facility 
eliminates um, the safety hazard that is currently there with a the viaduct. You'll get in and out of the city on both ends of the project and you'll have a nice smooth commute as you travel back and forth along Highway 99. That smooth commute is still more than two years away. After plenty of digging from Bertha, the installation of a two-deck highway, and the final demolition of the Alaskan Way Viaduct. But when it's done, we'll all have a deeper appreciation of what it means to travel in and under the city of Seattle. So what happens to all that dirt from the tunnel excavation after it's put on those barges? Well, it's heading over to Port Ludlow. It'll be cleaned up and used to fill an old quarry that's there. Bertha will be digging up so much dirt during this project that if you poured it all into CenturyLink Field, you'd have a mountain of dirt 400 feet high, 100 feet taller than the roof is right now. When we return, we'll find out how Bertha and her friends are using social media to make sure we know the latest info on road conditions and just what she's up to. Stay with us. With all the construction going on around Big Bertha, it's important to stay informed about what's going on. To help us out with that, we're joined by Kadena Yurkin from the Washington State Department of Transportation. Kadena, tell us a little bit about this. I think WashDOT's getting pretty creative when it comes to the messages that you're sending out about Big Bertha and this project. Yes, well, Big Bertha, it's, she's a superstar of the SR-99 tunnel project, and we want people to know what's going on. It's, it's a historic project for the state of Washington, and so we're using all the communications tools that we have to let people know what's going on and to get engaged in this project. So one of the things we're doing is uh, Twitter. Uh, Bertha has a Twitter account. Yeah, how many followers does she have? She has about 3,700 followers. Wow. Counting. Yeah, it's pretty good. She's been um, tweeting since about December. And uh, so it's Bertha Diggs SR99. If you haven't seen her tweets, uh, you should get out there and check them out. She talks a lot about what's going on with her, uh, what's going on with construction. She was really active when she rolled into Seattle on the Fair Partner. And she talked a lot about getting unloaded from the boat and then also getting lowered slowly into the launch pit where she's currently being assembled and tested. Right, chatty gal there. Uh, help me out with that though. Why use that social media? Why is that important for WashDOT to use those different avenues to reach out to people? Well, everybody engages in a different way and social media is just one other avenue for letting people know what's going on with this really important project. We're doing some historic things out there that WashDOT's never done before and it's going to impact the entire city. So we want people to know what's going on. This is state-of-the-art technology and Bertha is a one-of-a-kind machine that is really has a big job ahead of her and we think people want to know about it. They have a lot of curiosity and following her on Twitter is just one way to keep engaged um, in real time. And people would like to see Bertha in action if possible and I know there are some avenues to do that. Can you explain how WashDOT is making that available such that people can see some of this construction work happening? Yes, we have lots of ways you can do that. We have construction cameras that uh, take photos about every five minutes. So you can actually get on your computer, go to our website, and take a look at those construction cameras, see what's going on. That's a really easy way. If you want uh, to get out here closer to the action, you can come down to Milepost 31, which is where we are today. It's our project information center in Pioneer Square. It's on First Avenue. And you can learn a lot about the project down here. We've got photos down here. We've got Bertha's Twitter feed down here. If, you don't, if you're not a Twitter user, you can check it out down here. And we also offer tours for Milepost 31. Uh, they're about a one hour tour where a guide will walk you down to the construction site. It's about five blocks from here. And you can uh, walk up to the, kind of the stub end of the viaduct and get to peer down and look at uh, Bertha in the launch pit. Uh, you don't get to go on the construction site, but you get to see a whole lot from the viewing platform where you're at. That is indeed a great view from up there. Uh, tell us a little bit, though, about how WashDOT is trying to tell people more about traffic impacts from Big Bertha and all the construction projects going on here. I know especially the south end is impacted. Well, we have a lot of tools to really keep you engaged about traffic impacts. We have the WashDOT website, and Seattle DOT also keeps a great website with traffic impacts. Right now, we're really confined our traffic impacts to the south end of the project, that launch pit area where Bertha is at. But there's lots of other projects going on in the city of Seattle right now. You've got the seawall project that's going to start in the fall. You also have Mercer
Mercer East and Mercer West that are still continuing in construction. So you really need to pay attention to what's going on out there and check those websites, those Twitter accounts, anything that can keep you up to date. All right, thanks very much, Kadena. And if you want more information on all of this, make sure you go to our website, seattlechannel.org slash tunnel. We have a lot of information right there. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about how Big Bertha and all the construction projects around here could impact your commute. That's up next. Stay with us. Some commuters say Big Bertha is already causing some big problems when it comes to their trips to work. That's why the city, King County, and the state are working together to lessen the impacts of this construction project on drivers, transit riders, and cyclists. And project managers say once the tunnel's done, we'll have a much smoother transportation system in Seattle. But some critics aren't so sure. They're worried the traffic problems we're seeing right now could get even worse when the tunnel's completed. If you're among the 200,000 people who commute to downtown Seattle every day, you've probably noticed some changes since the construction of the Alaskan Way Tunnel started. Well, I was riding a local bus into town and, um, and there was always seating. Now there's not. Nancy Laswell comes in from the east side and she says between the rerouting of traffic around the tunnel project and the tolls on Highway 520, she's had to change how she gets to work. I-90 uh, is now extremely difficult to get onto and off of and, and so I quit reusing any of the 90 buses and switched up to the 520 buses because there frankly was more capacity on them. Crowded buses are a blessing and a curse for King County Metro Transit's Manager of Service Development, Victor Obeso. Transit demand is at, at highest levels we, we've, we've ever seen in this corridor. Here's the good news. A Gilmore research study shows two-thirds of Seattle's commuters are not driving alone to work. 43% of people are using public transit. And over the past decade, city figures show traffic downtown has not increased. In fact, total vehicle trips into Seattle are down 8%. We've done just what we set out to do. Obeso says his agency is doing its best to ramp up service, but Metro is dealing with a $75 million budget gap. State funding, as well as an emergency $20 car tab fee in King County, have helped bridge that gap but both those money sources are drying up. At the time we're having the, the greatest impact and effect and benefit to riders, we really face this impending issue, which is just one part of a crisis in funding that King County Metro faces. There's no argument over the need for the state to help Metro from Bo Morton. He's the vice president of the Transit Riders Union. We just need funding and we need people who recognize the value of transit. But his grassroots group, dedicated to improving public transportation, says the Alaskan Way Tunnel Project could do more harm than good. It's going to be bad north and south. Morton is worried because state forecasts show roughly two out of five drivers might get off Highway 99 and clog up city streets rather than pay the toll that's planned for the Alaskan Way Tunnel. We're going to see frustrated drivers. We're going to see frustrated transit riders. Uh, we're going to see longer commute times. The city is certainly concerned about uh, high levels of diversion from the Highway 99 tunnel. John Laser is the Seattle DOT's director of major projects. He helps coordinate how the city deals with major state-run projects like the tunnel. It will change traffic patterns to the people who use Highway 99 today and in the future. To deal with that traffic, the city has built a new 4th Avenue South off-ramp from the Spokane Street Viaduct to help West Seattle commuters get into downtown. Plus, new transit priority lights and other high-tech solutions are planned for the future, as well as the rebuilding of three streets across Aurora Avenue, as the tunnel will take vehicles to a new northern exit near 6th and Denny. We're working on the connections at the north and south ends of the tunnel to make sure that people who are coming to downtown have good connections into our downtown network. Those good connections won't come without disruptions, especially during the construction of the tunnel. And once it's done, it's tough to say how the tunnel will truly impact traffic simply because the cost of the toll hasn't been set yet. We're going to grab your skip box and we're going to swing around behind us. But as that number and other parts of this project take shape, the challenge is clear to demonstrate how the tunnel will improve access to the city. We will be a, a reborn city in that respect. While quieting the critics. I just think it's going to be slower and it's going to be kind of miserable. To make sure your commute keeps flowing smoothly, it's always best to know before you go. We've got all the links you need for the latest travel information and tips at our website, seattlechannel.org slash tunnel. When digging toward the future returns, how another aspect of the tunnel project is causing big waves along the waterfront.
Just about everyone agrees a new waterfront in Seattle will create some huge new opportunities for public spaces and for private businesses. But some of those merchants on the waterfront who have the most to gain from this facelift for Seattle are pushing back. They say the process of building the waterfront could put them out of business. State and city leaders are trying to help, but it's clear that building a new dream location on Elliott Bay could involve some nightmares along the way. What happens when you combine a major city waterfront with a viaduct that not only blocks off downtown from the water, but cranks out the noise equivalent of a garbage disposal running nearly 24 hours a day? The city has essentially turned its back on this most incredible natural asset. Maggie Walker is co-chair of the Central Waterfront Committee, appointed by the city to oversee the task of reclaiming Seattle's waterfront once the viaduct comes down. This is a waterfront for all, that's what we call it. Preliminary plans call for a new surface street to be built following the path of the viaduct. Most of Alaskan Way will be transformed into a promenade for pedestrians and bicyclists to enjoy Elliott Bay. Add in new piers and gardens, plus a link to walk between Pike Place Market and the water, and Walker says our city will finally have a chance to celebrate the natural splendor of the waterfront. Seattle has one of the most beautiful settings of any city in the world, and we need to honor that, and we need to make it much more central to our lives and not take it for granted. Okay, so that's the big picture, but the devil's in the details for many people who come to Seattle's downtown shorefront. We're from L.A. and parking yeah, I, doesn't seem to be this bad. Gary Gensimer had to circle under the viaduct three times to find a parking spot. But consider this. There used to be 3,500 parking places between the central waterfront and the stadiums. The new plan allows for just 160 parking spots in that area. You do the math. I think it's going to make it a lot of work to try to find a place to park. Can I get everyone's deep over here? Regular fish and chips and one halibut. Parking is just part of the problem for a business like Ivers, a Seattle waterfront icon. There's no way to get here. President Bob Donegan has been trying his best to keep clam in the face of city studies that show replacing the seawall, a critical part of the waterfront rebuild, could eliminate 73 percent of the 1,500 jobs here. We've got to find a mechanism to prevent those jobs from going away and protect those businesses. City Planning Director Marshall Foster has been tackling this frustrating issue with Donegan and other members of the Seattle Historic Waterfront Association, a group of businesses between Piers 54 and 57. There's no easy answer on this. Whenever there's major construction, it's hard on businesses. The seawall project is set to start this October and run through May, the less busy season for the waterfront. Next October, in 2014, Businesses at Piers 54, 55, and 56 have agreed to shut down completely for about seven months. The Great Wheel would stay open, as well as Argosy Cruises, which would shift its operations to other piers. The shutdown would allow contractors to work around the clock and finish the seawall project a year earlier than planned, by June of 2015, which could save the city tens of millions of dollars. Part of that savings, about 15 million, would be paid directly to the businesses who closed their doors compensating them for about 60% of their losses in that period. But the businesses here could make up for lost time. Experts say the number of waterfront visitors will double once the remodel is complete. It's going to be a, a very positive story for waterfront businesses long term. I think for us what we're figuring out is how do we create a very solid lifeline for them through the construction phase to make sure that they can make it through that. The state is also kicking in $30 million to help these businesses. Bob Donegan says that money will go toward marketing and the construction of three garages with a total of 900 parking places on the waterfront, Pike Place, and in Pioneer Square. But again, will 900 spots for parking really replace the 3,500 that used to be here? Not going to pretend that it's the perfect answer. We're continuing to work on it with them. Donegan says he's been meeting with Foster for dozens of hours each week to fine tune this deal. Marshall and I spend more time together than my wife and I spend together. But in the end, Donegan says this marriage of the city's goals with waterfront business interests will succeed because it has to. This is a once in a century opportunity. We have no choice but to make it work. And if it fails, it's our fault. We don't want that to happen. Leaders working on the Waterfront Project want to hear from you as to what you'd like to see in the redesign. The Waterfront Seattle Group holds public meetings frequently and will be at festivals and other community events through the rest of the year. For more information and to find out ways you can get involved, make sure you go to our website, 
seattlechannel.org slash tunnel. Thanks for joining us for this special Seattle Channel presentation, Digging Toward the Future, the story of the Alaskan Way Tunnel. We've learned a lot about Big Bertha, how to get around in traffic during the tunnel construction process, and a little bit about the future of the new Seattle waterfront. In fact, if you'd like to learn more about the tunnel and the many projects surrounding it, come on down to Milepost 31. It's right here in Pioneer Square on First Avenue South, just south of Yesler. Milepost 31 is a new museum that has more than just construction pictures. It also features interactive displays, history of the region, and the landscape that helped shape our city. Milepost 31 is open Tuesday through Saturday, and admission is free. The state DOT has information about a self-guided walking tour that you can take right along the edge of the construction site, so you can see firsthand Bertha and her crew in action. We've got that information, along with links to all the details you might want to know about the tunnel at our website, seattlechannel.org tunnel. Think of it as a one-stop shop for all things tunnel, travel, and waterfront related. I'm Brian Callanan, and thanks again for joining us on Digging Toward the Future, the story of the Alaskan Way Tunnel. Safe travels.